tonight, we're going to answer the question, uh, is there a future for Israel, or is there a future Israel? Um, it's a demanding question. Uh, Professor David has paid attention to Israel for a long time. He has very deep and profound concerns with the state of Israel and, uh, and its future, and is uh, uh, deeply aware, of course, of the, the neighborhood in which it lives, in which a few people have been accommodated in a way of Egypt and Jordan, perhaps, uh, but some very some great hostility, and uh, even if all of that were sort of resolved, you have the demographic problem, which has been with Israel for decades. Uh, how can you be both a, a Jewish and a democratic state, depending upon the demographics? And of course, there's some very serious uh, 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 threats. Uh, physical threats uh, to her existence. Uh, professor David is known to most of you. He uh, uh, teaches at Johns Hopkins, professor of international relations there. He's a graduate of Union College. He got a master's degree at Stanford in East uh, Asian Studies and a MA and a PhD in political science from Harvard. And after a year of uh, postdoctoral fellowship, uh, if they have good fellowship at Harvard. That, that was a mistaken statement on my part. In any case, he then came to Johns Hopkins in 1981 and has been there ever since in a very interesting uh, career, I think. Um, he's taught the basic international relations course. He's emphasized national security and really covered the waterfront of the serious questions in international relations while teaching there. I should note that uh, at least three times he got their uh, George Owen Award for Superior Teaching, which is quite an honor. Um, so he's, and while doing that, he was actively and deeply uh, engaged in the administration at the university. Uh, for almost a quarter of a century, he headed up, was director of the International Studies Program. And in addition to that, he was also uh, director of, the, of Jewish studies there for a period of time. Uh, he's been department chairman. He served within the administration in a variety of capacities, uh, including um, vice dean for undergraduate uh, studies. Uh, but his, his, his research is, is really of interest, uh, I think, uh, because it's focused upon the third world, essentially and raising questions about how that impacts on American foreign policy in the interest of other states. Um, so the, the books that he's written has, have, have sort of enmeshed him in the, the politics of smaller countries. And uh, his latest publication, talking about the dangers that can emerge from conflicts within these smaller states, is very contemporary. The, the entire discipline of international politics is concerned with world order and the way in which power is devolving into smaller actors and no longer just being a great power game. So his, his academic work has been a bit ahead of the curve, I think, in terms of uh, uh, that particular focus. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, the, the credentials are solid, as you, you all know. Uh, the uh, interests in uh, Israel and the threats to it. Uh, we know about, he spoke here five years ago on the question of Iran and, and nuclear weapons. Um, and tonight he's going to address the, the question of whether uh, Israel indeed has a future. We're very fortunate, it's a great pleasure, Professor Stephen David. Thank you, Frank, uh, for that introduction. Thank you all for coming. It's very nice uh, to be here. Um, my exciting news, which isn't relevant to my talk, is that I became a grandfather this week. So uh, anyway, and from here tomorrow, I go to my grandson's bris. So I'm, I'm excited, excited by that. Um, getting away from happier news, my talk today is a bit uh, more challenging subject. Uh, does Israel have a future? And the answer is not clear. I mean, Israel is perhaps the only country 
in the world whose continued existence is openly challenged. Uh, it makes sense to assess what the threats to Israel's existence are and whether they are likely to succeed. Before going over the outline of my talk, allow me two clarifications. First, when I ask, does Israel have a future, I mean as a Jewish and as a democratic state. For me, if Israel ceases to be a democracy or ceases to be a Jewish state, its existence is over, at least as I understand it. Second, putting my cards very much on the table, I very much hope Israel does have a future. What you're getting here is not a dispassionate lecturer from an objective observer. Instead, it's someone who's a Jewish American and very much wants Israel to succeed in meeting the very pressing threats it faces. My talk then is in four parts. First, I'm gonna talk about the phenomena of state death in general, how states die, especially recent state deaths. Now I'll look at the experience of how Israel has died in the past, how ancient Israel has died, and what lessons we can glean from that. I'll then look at threats to Israel's identity as a Jewish and democratic state, looking first at threats to Israel as a democracy, whether Israel can continue as a democracy. Second, whether Israel will continue as a Jewish state. And as we'll see, many of these threats come not from outside, but from within Israel itself. I'll then talk about external threats, and I'm gonna look at two broad types. First, efforts by the world community to delegitimize Israel, efforts, BDS, the United Nations, other groups. And then physical threats, the physical destruction, military threats, the physical destruction or conquest of Israel, the possibility that Israel might devolve into civil war, conventional conquest by its neighbors, and lastly, the threat of nuclear annihilation, especially as posed by Iran. And finally, I'll talk about, very briefly, what Israel needs to do to address these threats, and then very much welcome your comments and questions. So let me begin with state death in general. Now, it's important to realize countries used to die all the time. Over half the countries on the world map in 1816 no longer exist today. If you looked at a map in 1500 of Europe, you would have seen about 500 independent states and state-like units, 500. By 1900, it was down to about 20. So you had a brutal evolutionary process whereby big states gobbled up small states. And the most common cause of the death of states was conquest. The strong preyed upon the weak, conquered and destroyed or assimilated them. And Israel is no stranger to death by conquest. In ancient times, Israel has been destroyed at least three times. In 722 BCE by the Assyrians, in 586 BCE by the Babylonians, and 70 and 135 CE by the Romans. And after the last death, as I'm sure many of you are aware, it took nearly 2,000 years for Israel to reestablish itself. In modern times, state death has become much more rare. It's much more uncommon in modern times for states to die. Very few countries die anymore. Roughly 10, maybe less than 10, have died since the end of World War II. And conquest is especially uncommon. Since the end of World War II, only one country has been removed from the world's maps by conquest and that was South Vietnam in 1975. Most countries that have died in modern times, in effect, chose to end their existence. Soviet Union, Czechoslovakia, East Germany, South Yemen, mostly died peacefully. What can we learn then from the experiences of ancient Israel and modern state death? First and most obviously, states do in fact die. Again, Israel alone has died three times and can die again. But the way they die has changed. Con conquest and physical destruction through military actions can still happen. But again, it's very rare. You need to worry more about states losing their reason for existing. 
by focusing on elites and the people of the country, if they, if they no longer believe in the mission of their state, in the founding ideologies of their state, the state is in, is in trouble. And this is, unfortunately, I think, all too relevant for the state of Israel. So let me talk about state death in Israel. I mean, state death in Israel can come about in three main ways. It can cease to be a democracy, it can cease to be a Jewish state, or it can be physically destroyed in some military conquest. And I'm going to consider each in my talk tonight. First, let me talk about end of Israel as a democracy. Now, there are many challenges to Israel as a democracy. As Frank alluded to, one of the most compelling challenges and one of the most familiar is the demographic challenge. I mean, Jews make up roughly 75% of the population of Israel, and they have done so more or less throughout Israel's history. The Arab population of Israel has remained roughly constant at around 20%, and about 5% others. The birth rate of Israeli Jews and Israeli Arabs today is roughly equal. So if we're just talking about pre-1967 Israel, there is no real problem of the Jews maintaining a significant population majority. The problem develops, of course, when you consider the West Bank. There are roughly 2.7 million Arabs living in the West Bank. And if they are included in the population numbers, instead of a 75% majority, it goes down to a 58% Jewish majority. Making matters even more dire, the population, the birth rate of Arabs in the West Bank is much higher than that of Israeli Jews, or for that matter, Israeli Arabs. Plus, they are a much younger population. As a result, if trends continue, in a decade or so, you're going to have an Arab majority in a Jewish state. Despite this, Israel seems to be on its way to incorporating, assimilating the West Bank. Right now, you have roughly 400,000 Jews living in over 120 settlements scattered throughout the West Bank. New settlers and settlements continue all the time, including beyond the security barrier, not just settlements adjacent to Jerusalem, places that are likely to remain in Israel in a peace settlement, but settlements that are far afield. And this, of course, confronts Israel with a familiar dilemma if it absorbs the West Bank. If it gives the Palestinian Arabs the right to vote, Israel ends as a Jewish state. Presumably, they're going to vote for an Arab party. The Arab parties will be in a majority. End of Israel is a Jewish state. If you don't give the Palestinian Arabs the right to vote, it ends Israel as a democracy. How can you have a democracy? How can you call yourself a democracy if a large portion of your people, much less a majority of your people, are not given the basic right to vote? Either way, Israel, by incorporating the West Bank, by annexing the West Bank, ends Israel as a Jewish or as a democratic state. Aside from demographics, other factors call into question Israel's status as a liberal democracy. Now, to be fair, many understandably see Israel as a democracy in the Middle East, the only democracy in the Middle East. And there are good reasons for this. In Israel, basic rights are held by all. All of its citizens can vote, regardless of religion, background, or ethnicity. There are frequent changes of government. In Israel, you've got a free press. You've got an independent judiciary. You've got freedom of speech. Freedom House, which rates countries depending on how free they are, rates Israel as fully free, the only state in the Middle East to receive such a designation. So clearly, the essence of Israel is, remains democratic. But Israel democracy is under attack, both from within the state and outside. Leftist groups, Arabs, intellectuals, all call into question the notion of whether Israel is truly a democracy, especially a liberal democracy. Those who make the case that Israel is not a liberal democracy are not altogether mistaken. Liberal democracies, at least in their purest forms, treat all citizens the same regardless of religion and ethnicity. In a pure liberal democracy, 
something close to like what America is, what your religion is, what your ethnic background is, is irrelevant to the government, or supposedly should be. This is not the case with Israel. Israel is a self-proclaimed Jewish state, and Israel unashamedly uh, privileges the Jews. It does so in many ways. Many of its laws have a Jewish content. The law of return enables Jews, uh, people of Jewish ancestry, to get immediate citizenship in Israel, whereby others cannot. Jews can live in areas in Israel that others cannot. The national holidays are Jewish holidays. They Yom Kippur, their Passover, their Rosh Hashanah. The Israeli anthem, the Hatikva, talks of a Jewish soul. The flag has a Jewish star. With few exceptions, only Jews serve in the military. The basic law of Israel, in essence Israel's constitution, defines Israel as the state of the Jewish people. So if you are not Jewish, you are not part of the mainstream. This is not really your country, or not fully your country. Now, one can live with that, but one has to accept that. That if Israel is a democracy, it's a limited democracy. The problems that Israel faces in terms of being a full democracy are especially acute for the 20% of its citizens who are Arabs. They own less than 4% of the land, their communities get fewer resources, and Arab political parties, despite being now the third largest bloc in the Knesset, the Israeli parliament, Arab political parties have never been part of a governing coalition in Israel's history. The conclusion of many, Israel is not a liberal democracy, but is, as Israeli professor Sami Smucha calls it, it's an ethnic democracy. It takes the ethnic nation, in this case the Jews, not the citizenry as the foundation of the state, and does not extend equality of rights to all, as liberal democracies demand. Instead, the state privileges the majority and advances their interests rather than serving all its citizens equally. And thus you have minorities, people who are not Jewish, can never fully identify with the state. Now it is true that other democracies may favor groups based on ethnic or religious criteria. You can find evidence of this in Germany, in Finland, in Japan, in France. I mean, even in America. I mean, we have Christmas as a national holiday. Our money is pictures of white guys and our history privileges a certain group. But there's nothing in the constitutions of France, Germany, or the United States that creates second-class citizens defined by religion or ethnicity. Informal discrimination certainly exists in other liberal democracies. But except for Israel, it is not legal discrimination based on ethnicity or religion. And this doesn't mean that there's something wrong with Israel, or Israel has to be apologetic about it, but I think we have to face facts, and part of these facts are that Israel is not a full liberal democracy and will never be one. Insofar Israeli democracy is in trouble, things are likely to get worse, not better. The present government is the most right-wing in Israel's history. It's a mixed, uh, mix of settler parties, religious parties, ultra-nationalist parties, in the 2015 election, the last major election in Israel, right-wing parties won every district in Israel except Tel Aviv and some districts in Haifa. The rest of the country, they swept. So the commitment to liberal democracy, if it was under siege before, has become more shaky now. Contributing to the problems is the growing role of the Haredim, the ultra-Orthodox. They make up roughly 10% of Israel's population, but this is rapidly growing. In 2010, for the first time, more than half of the class entering primary school in Jerusalem, more than half, were Haredi children. Why is this an issue? Well, the Haredim display attitudes which are hostile or unfriendly to democracy. Over 70% do not want equal rights for Jews and Arabs compared to only one-third of secular Israelis who respond to this question. 89% believe Jewish law should take precedence over democratic law. 
It's the reversal among secular Israelis who feel secular law should take precedence over Jewish law. Many of the Haredim exercise political power because Israeli governments typically form coalitions that include Haredim parties, and these parties demand that their interests be met. So even though they're a minority, they, uh, their influence uh, punches above their weight. So insofar as the ultra-Orthodox population of Israel increases, democracy, in my view, is in greater trouble. More broadly, increasing numbers of Israelis express views hostile to democracy. For example, in the latest Pew uh, survey, nearly half, 48% of Israeli Jews, said that Israeli Arabs, they would like to see Israeli Arabs expelled or transferred out of Israel. And one in five Israeli Jews strongly believe in this. And this, to me, is, is, is horrifying. I mean, imagine a public opinion in, in America where uh, almost half the Americans said African Americans should be thrown out of the United States or, or, or Hispanic Americans. I mean, ideas, again, very antithetical to tolerance and democracy. This is very worrisome for Israel's commitment to democratic values. Along with the challenge to Israel as a democracy, there is a lesser challenge, and I emphasize that, a lesser challenge to Israel's identity as a Jewish state. And much of this challenge comes from Israelis themselves. There's a movement in the 1990s called the post-Zionist movement, made up of academics, journalists, authors, some political figures, who differed on a great deal. But what united them was a belief that Zionism was not legitimate, Again, the founding ideology of the Jewish people, the notion that they sh Israel should be a homeland for the Jewish people, was illegitimate. And many of them called for the end of Israel as a Jewish state. Again, they're pushing the democratic side of the equation against the Jewish side. Many of the post-Zionists saw Israel as a colonialist project. They painted an unheroic picture of Israel in its 1948 war, questioned the very notion as to whether the Jews exist as a people as opposed to simply a religion, and said Israel was not a democracy so long as it privileged Jews. Again, we're talking about Israelis here. The former speaker of the Knesset, Avraham Berg, went so far as to call for the end of the law of return and many other laws that gave Israel a specific Jewish character. Arab intellectuals also agreed they issued manifestos calling to end Israel as a Jewish state and instead demanded that Israel be a state for, quote, all of its peoples. In other words, eliminate the special status that Jews have in the country. Outside of Israel, British Jewish historian Tony Jutt created a stir by asserting that Israel, in fact, sadly was an anachronism in that it's a country that privileged one group over another. Judd saw Israel as a throwback to an earlier time, the late 19th century, when ethnic states were celebrated, that it was okay to base a state on ethnicity or religion. But Tony Judd argued that time has passed. And the problem with Israel is that it came to fruition, came to statehood at a time when the principle of ethnic or religious uh, states no longer held. He called on Israel to end its Jewish status and become a binational state with Arabs and Jews having total equality. His views gained much support in leftist and intellectual circles, including in Israel itself. Now, having said this, despite these challenges, I don't see any great danger of Israel losing its status as a Jewish state anytime soon. Those who worry about Israel continuing as both a Jewish state and a democracy have far more to worry about the assault on the democratic side of the equation than on its Jewish nature. Let me turn now to other threats to Israeli existence coming from mostly outside the country. And let me focus first on international efforts to de delegitimize Israel. International legitimacy is the belief that a country rightfully belongs to the community of nations, that a country has the right to be considered a sovereign state equal to other sovereign states. Legitimacy matters. 
It is a useful barrier against conquest. Many countries that have succumbed, many countries that have died, first were delegitimized before they were destroyed. Now, it used to be tough for a country to gain legitimacy. States had to demonstrate that they had full control over the territory that they governed, that they were truly sovereign in the land to which they claimed ownership. Not anymore. It's much easier now to be recognized as a state by the international community. Since World War II, countries can gain legitimacy by simply having a flag and a seat in the United Nations, even if the control of their government extends no further than their capital city, if that. I mean, Somalia, Libya, Syria are considered legitimate members of the international community, even though their governments barely can control the neighborhoods uh, of the capital. Interestingly, this ease of acquiring international legitimacy that began after World War II does not apply to Israel. Israel, pretty much alone in the world, is seen by many in the international community as being an illegitimate state, a pariah that does not belong in the family of nations. This is uh, put forth by many groups, most notably by the United Nations, which, as you know, ironically gave birth to Israel. I mean, Israel is one of the only states whose very existence was legitimated by the UN in the 1947 partition plan. Not anymore. The UN has become horribly biased against Israel. Just a few examples, and I'm sure many of you know many others. In 1975, the United Nations General Assembly overwhelmingly passed a resolution equating Zionism with racism, saying that Zionism, the yearning of the Jewish people for a homeland in Palestine, was racist. And again, overwhelmingly, this was agreed to. I mean, this resolution was later rescinded in the 1990s by American pressure, but the taint, the stigma, lingers on. In the General Assembly, of all the General Assembly resolutions that condemn a country by name, three quarters condemn Israel. 75% of the resolutions that condemn a country condemn Israel, and which is not to say that Israel is not worthy occasionally of condemnation, but you know, every once in a while you may want to throw Iran, North Korea, Syria, <laughs> just, you know, just for balance sake. The United Nations Human Rights Council has condemned Israel more times than the rest of the world combined. Combined. This matters. The United Nations bestows legitimacy on states. It gives states uh, the branding that they are legitimate in the international community. And their, hosti their hostility to Israel can't help but erode that legitimacy. Non-government organizations also gang up on Israel, NGOs. They came alive in the 2001 Durban Conference in South Africa, a conference ostensibly against racism, but a conference that turned into an orgy of anti-Israel and indeed anti-Semitic hatred. A forum of, atten of attendees of the conference called for, and I quote, the complete and total isolation of Israel as an apartheid state. Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, who attended this conference, also seem to have a special animus towards Israel. Then you have the BDS movement, the Boycott, Divestment, and Sanction movement, which among other things calls for Israel to grant the right of return to all of the Palestinian refugees who left Israel in 1948 and their descendants. Many, many millions of Palestinians, which if enacted, would be instant demographic suicide for Israel and the instant end of Israel as a state. So here you have a group that at least indirectly calls for Israel as a state, and yet is very popular in some circles. BDS is especially effective on college campuses, which for some reason don't feel a need to boycott any other country in the world. Also in America, the Presbyterian Church, the United Methodist Church, the pension funds of Holland and Sweden have all participated, uh, supported the BDS movement. My own field, academia, 
You have academic organizations which boycott Israeli scholars. And when you push them, they say, well, we're concerned about the plight of Palestinian academics in the West Bank. And so it's, it has to do with freedom of, uh, of academics to do their job. Interestingly, not a single of these organizations have talked about boycotting Turkey, which in the aftermath of the coup this summer has fired some 5,000 professors, closed multiple universities. That seemingly is okay, uh, but problems that Israel has in the West Bank apparently is not. All of these efforts, drip, 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 contribute to the pariah status of Israel. Also contributing to this pariah status is something called lawfare, not warfare, lawfare, the use of legal tactics to secure a political objective. Israel has been vilified and condemned by the International Criminal Court and the International Court of Justice. In the International Criminal Court, this is a court that argues that it has universal jurisdiction. That is, it can indict citizens anywhere for crimes they committed anywhere. So if you're an Israeli traveling in France, presumably the ICC can call upon France to arrest you, hold you for trial uh, because of alleged crimes you may have committed in, in the conflict in Gaza or in southern Lebanon or elsewhere. And in fact, this has had an effect. Senior Israeli officials, senior Israeli military people, including retired people, have been warned not to travel to some West European countries for fear they will be set upon and arrested. The, in, the International uh, Court of Justice has declared Israel's security fence to be illegal and ordered that it be torn down. Public opinion throughout the world, and especially in Europe, has joined this anti-Israel train. A 2013 poll uh, by the BBC found Israel to be one of the least popular countries in the world. Only 21% of the respondents had a positive image of Israel. 52% were negative, and this placed Israel in the same category as North Korea, Pakistan, and Iran. Not exactly a group you want to be associated with. Another survey conducted in Europe had 59% of the Europeans from 15 countries agreed that Europe, uh, uh, agreed that Israel was the greatest threat to peace in the world. So more than half of the Europeans agreed that if you look around the world, you look at Iran, you look at North Korea, you look at Saudi Arabia, you look at all of the, you look at Russia, um, all of these dangerous places, uh, but no, the greatest threat is Israel. One bright spot is that American support remains high. Most public opinion polls have American support, 60 to 70 percent favorable to Israel versus around 17 percent for the Palestinians. But even this support is showing signs of erosion. For one thing, it's becoming less bipartisan. A recent poll had 83% of Republicans strongly supportive of Israel versus only 48% of Democrats. So a majority of Democrats were not prepared to be supportive of Israel. It's ironic also in that American Jews, of course, are overwhelmingly members or supporters of the Democratic Party. Another warning sign is that younger Americans, including American Jews, are becoming less supportive of Israel, as well as minorities. So the future doesn't look all that bright. If American support to Israel ends or dramatically lessens, Israel's existence is called into question. There is no country that is more important to Israel in terms of military support, political support, diplomatic support, than the United States. Israel loses that, it's in a great deal of trouble. In sum then, the delegitimation efforts on their own will not destroy Israel, but they contribute to a process whereby Israel is seen by the world and even by many of its citizens as a pariah state that does not deserve to exist. The result is the gradual withering away of self-confidence and identity that can end the state. Think of the Soviet Union. Think of Czechoslovakia. The Czechs and Slovaks were getting along fine. Everything was hunky-dory. 
And then all of a sudden they said, why are we still doing this? We don't believe in this country anymore. Before anyone knew it, Czechoslovakia disappeared. It's a danger there for Israel as well. Okay, so much for democracy and Israel's character as a Jewish state. Let me now turn to military threats. So this was the good news. Now for the really bad news. I mean, we're going to give out Zoloft at the end of this talk. Uh, but military threats. And here we're talking about the physical destruction of the state. Now, one of the first military threats that Israel faces, a military threat that could do horrendous harm to the state, is the prospect of civil war. It's a remote uh, prospect. Again, uh, it's not something I'm predicting, but it's something that can't be totally discounted either. The most likely catalyst, an Israeli decision to remove the settlements in the West Bank in exchange for peace. As I mentioned earlier, you've got about 400,000 Israeli Jews living in the West Bank now. Many would live, leave peacefully in the context of some kind of peace agreement, and many could be bought out to turn to pre-67 uh, Israel. Moreover, many of the settlements, including the most populous, are likely to return to Israel in the context of any peace agreement. Settlements like Gush Etzion, Malay Adunim, they are likely to become part of Israel in any agreement. But that still leaves around 100,000 Israeli Jews living outside the security barrier who perhaps will not be prepared to leave so peacefully. Many are armed, are deeply nationalist, and deeply religious. They believe in their heart of hearts that, the God, that God gave this land to them and they are not going to be moved from it and they might fight to keep it. Moreover, making matters even worse, there are some questions as to whether the Israeli Defense Forces, the IDF, would forcibly evict these settlers. In the 1990s, around 2% of the officer corps and the infantry in Israel were religious. Today, the number is about 25%. You have some rabbis, thankfully a minority, but some rabbis, who have said that it would be against Jewish law to forcibly evict the settlers. The IDF has a principle, which comes from the Nuremberg Laws, that soldiers should not obey illegal orders. To what extent would religious Jews, would religious officers, obey orders that are causing them to do things that they feel violates the word of God? I don't know. If the order is given to remove the settlers then, you have a possibility of armed conflict with the settlers and a possibility of armed conflict within the IDF itself. It is worth remembering that the Jewish state of Judea that succumbed to the Romans in 70 CE did so because of a civil war among the Jews. And one faction invited the Romans in, the Romans came in, and the Jews Jewish state was destroyed, and there wasn't another Jewish state for another 2,000 years. So it was Jewish civil war that caused the destruction of the last Jewish state. Let's hope that's not repeated today. Another concern is the prospect that Israel will be conquered by its neighbors. From its birth, when Israel was invaded by five Arab countries, Israel has worried, constantly worried, that some coalition of its neighbors would get together and conquer it. Many of you in this audience probably remember the 1973 war. Believe me, my Hopkins students don't remember that at all. They don't, they don't remember the Cold War. Is that before or after the Peloponnesian War? But, you know, so it's, you all remember the 1973 war. And in that war, Israel was nearly overwhelmed by a surprised attack by Egypt and Syria. Today, Egypt, Syria, Iraq, Iran, Saudi Arabia have many times the soldiers, tanks, artillery, and aircraft than does Israel. There is always the possibility that they will get their act together, they will align with each other, and unite to conquer Israel. That said, I think conquest is very unlikely. Military conquest of Israel is very unlikely. It's unlikely for many reasons. First, as I indicated earlier, conquest simply doesn't happen anymore. I mean, it's 
uh, it really is an artifact of the past. One country conquering another country, gobbling it up, destroying it, thankfully doesn't happen anymore. Also unlikely, also what makes it unlikely, is that the specific balance of power of Israel and its adversaries make conquest less likely. And Israeli enemies are not likely to try and conquer Israel because they know they will lose. Israel maintains qualitative superiority over its Arab and Iranian enemies. And it's shown this in past wars. Its forces are better trained and motivated. Uh, Israel has a GDP per capita that is four times that of the Arab world. Its citizens are far better educated. They are simply much better soldiers and better able to exploit the technology of modern wars, and the Arabs know that. Moreover, America is committed to ensuring Israeli qualitative superiority. The United States, when it sells weapons to the Middle East, always ensures that Israel gets the best, the most sophisticated equipment, equipment that they are very uh, skillful in exploiting. Another reason why conquest is unlikely is that many of the countries that would be at the front line of trying to conquer Israel are themselves wracked by internal conflict, making them far less powerful as external adversaries. Iraq and Syria can barely control what goes on within their own country, much less project force much beyond their borders. Egypt, a major rival to Israel in the Middle East, has now become very close to Israel. Saudi Arabia has even become somewhat friendly. Another reason why conquest is unlikely is that the Arab states do not have a superpower ally in their backyard uh, backing them up the way they had in 1973. Yes, Russia is still around, and Russia can cause mischief, and Russia can cause problems, as we certainly saw in Crimea. But it doesn't have the ability to make massive airlifts of weapons and equipment to change the balance of a conflict as it came close to doing in 1973. It's just not the superpower uh, it once was, which doesn't mean, again, that it can cause trouble. I mean, just talk to the people in the Trump administration and all the other stuff that's going on there. But as a military power, uh, it is not the way it used to be. And finally, Israel is safe from conquest because I have a secret to tell you. Israel is a nuclear weapons state. <laughs> Israel has over 100 nuclear weapons. They are very well protected in submarines and underground bunkers and, and, and aircraft. Um, they cannot be disarmed in a first strike. If the Arab states and Iran ever got so lucky as to threaten to overwhelm Israel, they know they would be committing suicide in doing so. So these nuclear weapons give Israel very much of a life insurance policy, which says to potential aggressors, you can't conquer us without being destroyed yourself, which is a very strong deterrent. Now, this is not to say that everything is you know, perfect, everything is hunky-dory for Israel, security threats still exist. You've got terrorism, you've got Hamas and Hezbollah, the situation can change. But for now, at least, it's remarkable that the major fear of Israel throughout much of its history, that it would be conquered by its Arab neighbors, is very, very unlikely to come to pass. Less remote, however, is another threat that faces Israel. That's the threat of nuclear annihilation. If nuclear weapons help ensure Israel's security, they are also the greatest threat at ending Israel as a state. As I argued, it's difficult to see Israel succumbing to conventional attack. Nuclear attack is something else. A nuclear attack against any country would be devastating, but it's especially devastating against Israel. Israel is a tiny state about the size of New Jersey. Uh, three of its cities, Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, and Haifa, make up nearly half the population. You destroy two of those cities, you pretty much ended Israel as a country. Because of the fear of nuclear attack, Israel has a policy to make sure none of its neighbors acquires nuclear weapons. In 1981, it destroyed the Ozirak reactor in Iraq, uh, making sure that Saddam Hussein didn't get nuclear weapons. 
And in 2007, it destroyed the Syrian nuclear reactor, making sure that Assad didn't get nuclear weapons. And by the way, America refused to destroy that reactor, and we all owe a debt of gratitude to Israel for doing so, because can you imagine what would have happened if Syria did get nuclear weapons, and then ISIS comes along, takes over most of the countries, and perhaps inherit those weapons? A very, very scary scenario. The big concern today, however, is Iran. Why is Iran such a concern? Well, you have a slew of statements by Iranian leaders calling for Israel's destruction. For example, the Supreme Leader, the present Supreme Leader, Ali Khamenei, in July 2014, talked about this barbaric regime of Israel has no cure but to be annihilated. Other leaders of, in Iran have called for Israel to be wiped off the map, to be burned to the ground, and similar incendiary statements. Iran actions also cause concerns. They support Hamas and Hezbollah, groups which unashamedly call for the destruction of Israel. The Iranians were behind terror targets, uh, behind terror attacks on Jewish targets, such as the bombing of the Jewish Community Center in Argentina in 1994. But of course, the concern today is Iranian nuclear capability. There is no question that Iran has been on a quest to develop nuclear weapons. <clears throat> there are two essential paths to getting nuclear weapons. You can, one, enrich uranium, where you take natural uranium, turn it into a gas, spin it in thousands of centrifuges, and then you get uh, weapons for a, a nuclear bomb. Or a plutonium bomb, where you have a nuclear reactor which produces plutonium as a byproduct. You separate the plutonium out of the uh, nuclear rods, and you have what is necessary for a bomb. Iran has been pursuing both paths. Uh, it's pursuing both paths at great expense, great secrecy, and duplicity. It built nearly 20,000 centrifuges and a reactor capable of producing plutonium. It put them largely underground in mountains in violation of the agreements that it had signed. Look, it simply makes no sense for a country that's awash in oil and gas to put billions of dollars into a program, suffer billions of dollars of losses and sanctions for a nuclear program that is not designed to make nuclear weapons. Now, some say the threat is now over, that the nuclear arms deal signed between Iran and the Obama administration and five other states has ended the Iranian threat. And there is no question that the deal has made some progress in constraining Iran's nuclear efforts. It's reduced the number of centrifuges, ensured that Iran's nuclear reactor could not produce plutonium, sent much of its nuclear fuel out of the country. It's done a lot of good. But even supporters of the deal acknowledge that in 10 to 15 years, when most of the constraints on the deal will be removed, Iran will then be able to make a nuclear weapon very quickly. Even President Obama admitted that once these constraints are removed, Iran can produce a nuclear weapon virtually overnight. As such, this deal enshrines Iran as a nuclear threshold state. So a regime that is sworn to destroy Israel is thus getting the capability to do what it threatens. If Iran gets nuclear weapons, Israel, in my view, cannot rely on deterrence for its safety. When we talk about deterrence, we're talking about persuading someone not to do something they are capable of doing by threatening them with unacceptable punishment if they do it. Deterrence in the nuclear realm is most clear in the U.S.-Soviet balance during the Cold War. We and the Soviets could have destroyed each other. We could have destroyed the Soviet Union any day we chose. The Soviets could have destroyed us any day they chose. They didn't because they know if they blew us up, we would blow them up in return. The same was true for us and them. But just because it worked during the Cold War doesn't mean it's going to work between Israel and Iran. During the Cold War, you had rational leaders, you had mutual recognition between the countries, and you had, for all the problems, a relatively muted conflict. None of that is true with Iran and Israel today. You've got a leadership who some of whose views border on fanaticism, there is no recognition of Israel's right to exist. And the conflict, rather than being muted, is a conflict to the death. And don't even get me started on other ways that deterrence can be undermined, in terms of accidents or some crazy colonel launching an unauthorized attack, 
or what happens if Iran, the Iranian leadership has nuclear weapons and its regime is about to be toppled? Who's to say that the leaders, knowing that they are going to be overthrown and probably killed, wouldn't launch nuclear weapons against the Jewish state? One parting shot for posterity. When the ancient Israelites put their faith in the reasonableness of Assyria, Babylonia, and Rome, it didn't work out so well. So too would be the case with a nuclear-armed Iran. So let me conclude now. Uh, <laughs> conclude and discuss what to do. I began the talk with the observation that Israel is one of the only countries whose existence is openly called into question. The specific threats to Israel's existence frighteningly echo the destruction of the ancient Israelite kingdoms and the experience of state death today. Like the ancient Israelite kingdoms, Israel faces the prospect of physical destruction, being wiped off the map. Like contemporary states, there is a fear that Israel will be fundamentally transformed from within, as its people's commitment to democracy or Judaism weakens, turning the country into something its founders and supporters would not recognize. So what to do? Well, first, we've got to recognize which threats are most pressing and which less so. I think some of the less pressing threats are, threats are that Israel loses its Jewish identity. I don't think that's in the cards. Civil war, I also think, highly unlikely. Also, conventional conquest, highly unlikely. Now, these threats exist. They cannot be dismissed altogether, but I think far less likely. The two key threats then are the internal and external threat. The internal threat is that Israel will cease to be a democracy. The external threat that will become victim of a nuclear attack, most likely by Iran. How to respond to these threats? Well, in terms of democracy, Israel must do many things. But none will matter if it does not maintain a large Jewish majority in the state. None of the things it might do with the Supreme Court, with the Haredim, with any of the things will matter if it can't maintain a large Jewish majority in the state. And that means, in my view, that it must be prepared to withdraw from the West Bank, paving the way for an eventual Palestinian state. And in practical terms, this is not as difficult as some, as, some allege. Roughly 80% of the Israeli Jewish population in the West Bank lives on less than 5% of the land. True, a withdrawal would be fraught with risks, but none of the risks are worse than Israel losing its democratic character by losing its Jewish majority. The threat from Iran, Israel cannot let Iran develop nuclear weapons, full stop. It cannot rely on deterrence or Iranian restraint or rationality. If Iran shows signs of developing nuclear arms, whether the Iranian agreement is still in place or not, and the U.S. will not take any action to destroy Iran's developing nuclear capability, then Israel must act on its own to ensure its survival, including launching a military strike despite the many problems that such a strike would ensue. It simply cannot allow its existence, its survival, to, to be put in the hands of the Iranian leadership. In sum, then, Israel's birth and survival against all odds is a remarkable story. If Israel is to continue to survive, it must recognize that life, even for a state, is fragile. That the decisions taken now will place Israel either on the path towards continued existence or bring about the demise of the state. Let's hope that Israeli leaders and the Israeli people choose wisely. Thank you. I am open for questions, comments. Uh, as long as they're real questions, okay, over here in the back, and then you're, you're next. Okay, the question is a good question. What about the ultra orthodox being exempted from the military draft, um, especially as they make up a larger portion of the population? Um, won't Israel have to reconsider uh, these, uh, these exemptions? Uh, a couple of things. First, modern militaries are less dependent on man and, and woman power than they were in the past. Uh, 
even uh, interesting discussions in Israel that maybe the universal draft has outlived its usefulness. In, in many ways, it's more of a social um, exercise than it is a military one, just bringing people of very different backgrounds together um, in, in one organization. But many of the Israeli military leaders say, we don't need all of these people, which would call for less of a demand of, of the Haredim to be put into the military. That said, um, past Netanyahu administrations did push for the Haredim to be uh, part of the Israeli military, and there were efforts made to force them to do so. But then you have a new government, and uh, the religious parties then become part of that coalition, and the efforts to make them part of the military vanish. So as long as Israeli domestic politics is driven by the need to appease the demands of the religious parties, uh, drafting the Haredim is probably not going to be on the table. I should say some of them do serve. I think 17% or so, some of them do serve. Uh, but the overwhelming majority do not. OK, well, there's a lot into the question, essentially arguing that rather than sort of suggest that Israel launch a preventive military strike against Iranian nuclear facilities, they look at better ways to prevent Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons in the first place and using the 15 years that the Iran deal has provided uh, to seek avenues for peace so that a nuclear armed Iran would, would not be such a horrible adversary. I mean, I essentially agree with the essence of the question. Uh, I think an Israeli military strike on the nuclear facilities of Iran would be horrific. It's not even clear it would be successful. It would be far more difficult than the strikes on the Syrian and Iraqi uh, reactors. And Iran is opening up new avenues for peace, uh, albeit uh, inadvertently. One of the reasons that countries like Saudi Arabia are cozying up to Israel is that they fear Iran much more than Israel. They are much more concerned about a Shiite-dominated Middle East backed by Iran than they are by the threat by Israel. And this opens up a lot of avenues uh, for Israel to make peace with its Arab neighbors, and perhaps some of that could extend to Iran as well. So the question is, another possibly destabilizing factor, the appointment of David Friedman uh, as ambassador, U.S. ambassador to Israel. Again, I, I don't know David Friedman. I've read about his views. He seems to be very partial to the settler community. Um, He's also Donald Trump's bankruptcy lawyer, so <laughs> sounds like he's kept busy, at least in the 1990s, at least uh, dealing uh, with stuff. Um, I mean, ambassadors typically don't carry that much weight. What, what really matters is what the president and what the administration wants. Uh, we've seen Trump already change his views, or at least modify his views on several areas. First, the settlements were fine. Now they're not so fine. He's going to move Jerusalem on day one to Jerusalem, uh, move the embassy to Jerusalem on day one. Now, not so fast. So, possibly David Friedman uh, will be uh, constrained as well. We'll just have to wait and see. Well, obviously, we thank you. That was a hugely informative, wise, and beautifully delivered. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you all. Thank you.